afternoon. I'm Bill Nelson, the director of the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. And I'd like to try and do three things this afternoon. One is to give you a brief glimpse into where medicine is headed, and that's towards the delivery of individualized health care on a population scale. Give you a sense for how an explosion in genome analysis technology, DNA sequencing and the like, is driving this transformation of medicine. And then share with you how for cancer medicine, the future has become the present. We're already taking on cancer health care in this way. Now, why does medicine have to change? And the reason is because the threats that we see for the coming century are not swine flu. They're not SARS. They're not even cholera. They're not the traditional health challenges. Instead, they're becoming chronic diseases, obesity, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, and cancer. And what many of you may not realize is just last year, cancer became the leading cause of death for all mankind across the planet Earth. For the last 10 years, cancer has killed more people than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. The challenge for the future is a different kind of disease, and we need a different kind of medicine. Now, how did medicine work in the 20th century? Well, Johns Hopkins was largely responsible for the paradigm. It was a version of medicine that started when someone came with symptoms and a physician visited them at the bedside. The physician would ask questions. When did the symptoms start? What was their severity? What was it associated with? They would then use their physical examination, stethoscopes, hands, fingers, the tools that they had to try and sense what organ dysfunction was accompanying these symptoms. And then the great physicians like William Osler would reason through this, creating a differential diagnosis. What are the possibilities of an acute illness that may have uh, created this body of symptoms and is the you know, major threat to health. And in that paradigm, of course, disease and health were the two, it was a dichotomous arrangement. You were either sick or you were healthy. These chronic diseases are very, very different, right? It's challenging the very way we think about what is health and what is disease. Someone with an elevated blood pressure doesn't have symptoms. Someone with an elevated cholesterol doesn't have symptoms. And yet we know if we use this cue to intervene, we can head off life-threatening or morbidity-threatening disease. So we need to build a health system that works in such a way that we can take advantage of the potential uh, to survey and inventory inborn traits or susceptibilities to illnesses we can survey life experiences that might lead to illnesses and then modulate or modify them in ways that are ever more effective at promoting health, not at just treating disease. Now, cancer, of course, is a great example of this. One of the major things that's gonna drive this is an explosion in genome analysis technology. So what's the genome? Of course, it's the blueprint for all the components of all the cells and all the tissues in the body and it's arranged in bases that you've learned about, A, T, G, and C. It's packaged in particular ways that permit the function of the genome to make certain components in certain cells and not other components in others. But it's our ability to analyze this. Years ago, we could analyze it only in glimpses of small parts of the genome. We can now quite literally look at all three billion base pairs in a cancer cell and a normal cell all at once, creating this humongous amount of information. In fact, the information itself is becoming daunting and extremely challenging because of how fast the technology is moving. Many of you are aware of uh, Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, and what he predicted about the microprocessor business, which drove this revolution in information uh, science and technology, was that the density of transistors uh, or microprocessors on a, a chip was going to double every 18 months. And everyone at the time said, well, that's true for what's happened, but eventually you're going to run into a barrier in technology. You're not going to be able to have that happen. And of course, that's happened almost like an atomic clock ever since. The analogy for genome sequence is uh, how rapidly does the cost of sequencing the genome fall by a factor or two, fall in half, and it was going on every 14 months or so. The same kind of argument was generated. Uh, this has uh, you know, worked well so far, but we're going to run into a technological barrier that slows us down. We didn't. We ran into a cliff. The ability to sequence genomes now, you can get it for just a 
few thousand dollars within a year or two, it'll be for a few hundred dollars. This is in the price range of a CT scan, an MRI, a visit to a doctor. You can get your whole genome sequence. But this generates a huge amount of information. Words like petabytes and petaflops are what people use. Ken Fassman, who's here in the audience, a classmate of mine from medical school and one of the leaders in this business, uh, he and I were joking a little bit right now, one of the problems is, is when you sequence a whole genome, you're given a hard drive that you plug into your computer, most of the computers just crash and no one knows what to do with them. So there are some uh, hiccups that we have to get through. Cancer has been particularly effectively taken on by this mechanism because unlike all the rest of the diseases, cancers are fundamentally diseases of acquired defects in these genes. So in the situation of cancer medicine, not only are you looking for inter-individual variation in genes and genetic susceptibility, but you're looking at what went wrong in a cell that generated a cancer. What was that inventory of cancer mistakes? Now, at Johns Hopkins, we've been a leader in this field, driving most of the genome sequencing in cancers. Great researchers, Bert Fogelstein, C. Balin, and the like. But how are we going to turn this into an individualized approach to cancer care? And I'd like to give you two examples of what is sort of already happening. One related to the way we discover and develop new anti-cancer treatments, and the other an example for how we might use the treatments we have more effectively, saving money and improving healthcare outcomes. Historically, we've developed some great cancer treatments, but we've done it in a way that is now proving to be cumbersome and inefficient. Right? For the last half century, we've looked in every nook and cranny of the environment, in all the uh, shelves of the chemical companies, to find drugs that kill cancer cells. And basically, they all had a similar property. The more you gave to a cancer cell in a dish, the more cancer cells you killed. So the clinical development challenge was, how much could I give someone? Because the more I gave them, the more likely I was to kill the cancer cells in their body. So you went through this process of treating three people with a life-threatening cancer with a little bit of an anti-cancer drug, seeing what side effects they had, increasing the dose for the next three, and so forth, until you got to, quite literally, the dose-limiting toxicity, that's a formal term, and the maximally tolerated dose. And then that's the, the dose you would take you didn't have any idea which cancer it might work for, so you then would go try almost every cancer in an individual clinical trial. Does this work for breast cancer? Does it work for lung cancer? Does it work for pancreas cancer? And if it did, then you'd say, is this better than the best we got so far? That clinical trial evolution takes forever. It's extremely expensive. And here we have a whole treasure trove of new ideas how to treat cancer. We cannot develop these drugs in this old-fashioned way. How is it going to work in the future? Now the avenue to a new drug is based on an inventory of the gene defects in a cancer. So we say, ah, there's a defective gene, which is the blueprint for a protein that is functioning abnormally to drive the cancer. Can we develop a small molecule or other drug to stop that dysfunction of the protein? Now think about this. If we can do so, this is only going to help the person who has the cancer that has this change. Right? It won't help anybody else. So this notion of an average patient with breast cancer or an average patient with lung cancer goes right out the window. You only want to treat the people with this particular acquired genome defect. This enables you to move much more quickly into development with these drugs. You identify who these people are, you give them the agent, it should work. If it doesn't work, you're done. If it does work, you're ready for FDA approval. Some of the drugs that have been developed in this way get FDA approval after just the treatment of a handful of people, dozens perhaps. So this is going to very, very much change how efficiently and how rapidly we get new treatments to people with new diseases. And by the way, most of these new types of drugs have far less side effects. These aren't drugs that drop hair onto the floor and make people vomit, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole new class of cancer medicines called targeted therapy. You'll hear about them and read about them. Now, what about using the treatments and the drugs we have in a better way, in a more effective way? Well, I think this is where some of the inter-individual variation is going to come into play. Here's a story for you. Women who have breast cancer that is fueled by the female hormone estrogens can respond, their cancers can, uh, to interfering with that fuel, uh, fueling relationship. And there's sort of two general ways you can do it. One is you can block the action of estrogen on the cancer cell with a, something that intercepts estrogen as it tries to interact with the cancer cell or you can block the ability to make estrogen in the woman's body. So there's not making any estrogen, there's nothing to fuel the cancer. 
The drug that blocks the action of estrogen, called tamoxifen, has been around for a very long time. We know it's an effective treatment. It has some other interesting properties, which are very important for a woman, perhaps in menopause or, or whatnot with breast cancer, and that it uh, puts calcium into bones rather than leaches it out, et cetera. Now, a few years ago, two new drugs came onto the scene and onto the market uh, that blocked the production of estrogen. These drugs aren't perfect, right? Because by stopping the production of estrogen, they result in leaching of calcium out of the bones and many, many side effects. So you'd love to use these drugs only when you needed to. The other thing, obviously, is they're still under patent and whatnot. They're far more expensive than tamoxifen, right? But in a trial that was done for the average woman with breast cancer fueled by the estrogen uh, compound, you can see on the slide that you, you can look at a marginal benefit plotted to people remaining free of disease over time. That yellow line, the aromatase inhibitor, blocks the production of estrogen. There's a marginal benefit, and this was the basis for the FDA approval of these drugs and their use. Right? But what turns out is that uh, about 16% or so of women, when they take tamoxifen, metabolize it differently than other women. The reason they do is they have inter-individual differences in the blueprints that encode the metabolizing gene, metabolizing protein. And if you then take those women out of the pool, right, you take the 84% of women who metabolize tamoxifen well enough that it can block the action of estrogen in the breast cancer cell, there's no difference between tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitor drugs and far less side effects. So the majority of women should take tamoxifen. The only women who should be taking the aromatase inhibitor are the smaller group, 14 to 16% of them, who don't metabolize tamoxifen in the same way. So think about this on a population scale. We reserve the expensive drug with more side effects to the few women who need it. We take the less expensive drug uh, with less side effects and the majority of the women get it. There are not many times in our health system as it evolves where we're gonna get a better outcome at a cheaper price. Individualized medicine on a, on a population-based scale. So all of this sort of in summary is leading to the strategy to give the right treatment to the right person at the right time. So how are we going to do this at Johns Hopkins? What do we need? We recognize to really do this well that we have to look beyond just the Kimmel Cancer Center, beyond the School of Medicine, and begin to figure out what assets garrisoned around the university can be brought to this problem. This is a huge information scale problem. And then we gone and found like-minded people in the Whiting School of Engineering, the School of Public Health, the Berman Institute of Bioethics and the like, and we've been working for the last year together trying to figure out how we can take this on. And what's united us is the urgency of this cause because quite literally, lives are in the balance. We need to deliver this kind of healthcare and we need to deliver it quickly. We need to transform our health system for this to work. And why wait? Thank you. <laughs>